Born in the age of the horse and buggy, he would lead his service and the nation to the atomic age. He was taught to fly by Orville Wright himself and became one of the first officers in the Army certified as a pilot. A career Army officer educated at West Point, he used every opportunity he could find to promote and create a new viable wing of the service. He stressed planning and training and preparation for the unthinkable. And in so doing, took a nation unprepared for war to victory. His name is General Henry H. Hap Arnold. He's called the father of the Air Force, and he is a legend of air power. Pennsylvania physician. Dr. Arnold, who served with the Pennsylvania Cavalry during the Spanish-American War, wanted one of his sons to carry on in the military service. It was expected that Harley, as he was then called, would pursue the ministry. Instead, his brother sought a degree in electrical engineering, and Hap, short for Happy, entered West Point with visions of joining the cavalry himself. When Henry H. Arnold entered West Point in 1903, the Army was still a place of horse cavalry and artillery. But the explosion of new technology that marked the end of the 19th century was making itself felt now in the 20th. The Wright brothers had made their historic first flight, but had yet to sell a single airplane to anyone. The only kind of aviation the military used was observation balloons at battlefields, a technique over 50 years old. But in 1907, within months of Arnold's graduation with a degree in engineering, the Army Signal Corps created the Aero Division. Their orders were clear, to study the flying machine and the possibility of adapting it to military purposes. In December, the Chief of the Signal Corps issued the first request for proposals for a military airplane. It must be able to carry two men, fly for at least an hour with a range of 125 miles and be capable of attaining a speed of 40 miles per hour. The test flights for the Wright Flyer took place at Fort Myer, Virginia. Using a catapult launching system, Orville Wright himself flew the initial runs and even carried a passenger to demonstrate the plane's performance. The evaluations take another year, but on August 2nd, 1909, the Army orders its first aircraft, a Wright Modified Model A military flyer for $30,000. It is the beginning, and Arnold is there. On July 12, 1912, Arnold becomes the first of three officers to receive the wings of a certified military aviator. None other than Orville Wright has trained them all. When war does break out among the European powers, the U.S. government maintains strict neutrality. Following the sinking of the liner Lusitania with American passengers on board, President Woodrow Wilson finally commits American troops to the fight. American flyers will go. They enter the fray flying modern French and English pursuit planes against battle-hardened aces like von Richthofen. Before the war's end, in a little over a year, Lieutenant Henry Arnold would become Major Henry Arnold. And in 1919, following the armistice and return home, Colonel Hap Arnold would be given command of the Western District of the United States for the Army Air Corps. 
With the end of the First World War comes enormous pressure from all sides to disarm. Arnold knows that the challenge facing the Air Corps is greater now than during the war. Congress has slashed the operations budget. Naval and Army commanders believe the Air Corps must be kept in a subsidiary support role to the infantry and artillery. Arnold believes the air arm must be independent of the ground and naval forces. It is a battle he will fight for the rest of his life. But for now, 1919, he must find new ways to keep his men trained and prepared. He does so by assisting California's lumber industry and parks, forest fire spotting, training them for aerial surveillance and mapping missions of the Western District. He even grants permission for some of his pilots to participate in air races and endurance flights, most notably the irrepressible Lieutenant Jimmy Doolittle. The questions of endurance and range of aircraft also intrigue Arnold. In mid-1923, two important endurance milestones occurred. In May, the first non-stop transcontinental crossing of the United States was made by a Fokker T2 transport, which flew from New York City to San Diego in 26 hours and 51 minutes. And then just weeks later, the first successful mid-air refueling flight was made, allowing a de Havilland DH-4B to stay airborne over San Diego for six hours and 38 minutes. On May 20th, 1927, Charles Lindbergh, a 25-year-old civilian pilot, took off from Roosevelt Field, Long Island. 33 hours and 39 minutes later, landed at Orly Field, France. Like most, Arnold celebrated the achievement by the American, but unlike many, he recognized the military significance of the flight. Once crossed, there could be no turning back. There would be no limit on air power. The winter of 1932 brought with it unprecedented blizzards in large sections of the Southwest. As many as 20,000 Indians were starving in remote isolated villages. Washington asked Arnold for help. Recognizing that there was no place for his planes to land, Arnold determined that his bombers could air bomb food with precision into the affected areas. One of his sergeants boasted that toward the end, we could drop a dozen eggs without breaking one. And then in 1934, Arnold was selected to lead a flight of B-10 bombers from Washington, D.C. to Fairbanks, Alaska territory and back. The mission? Demonstrating long-range flight, even in remote, unmapped areas. It was a huge success and drew the attention of many. He won his second McKay Trophy, and he was jumped two grades to Brigadier General and given command of the first wing at March Field. The new president, Franklin Roosevelt, despite the Great Depression, saw the need for a new emphasis on the military because of problems he saw developing in Europe. Where previous administrations had slashed military spending to maintain a balanced budget, FDR saw the need for a new modern air corps. That would take lots of aircraft which began with a thoroughly modern four-engine B-17 bomber. He pressed for more extensive training running mock air raids on Long Island. Then Arnold went after a modern pursuit plane, each element a piece of his overall vision for a true Air Force. The Munich Pact in 1938 sealed convictions in Washington that a second world war was inevitable. Within a week, Roosevelt, aware of how unprepared America had been for the first war, asked Congress to provide funds to expand aircraft production. I should like to see this nation geared up to the ability to turn out at least 50,000 planes a year. He tapped Arnold to be Air Corps Chief and promoted him to Major General. Now a member of the General Staff, Arnold began preparing for war with Nazi Germany. Yesterday, December 7th, 
27, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. The United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. Germany declared war on the United States the next day. But Arnold has been preparing for nearly two years. He has quietly prepared American industry for wartime aircraft production. Flying fortresses have already been dispatched to remote bases in Alaska and the Pacific. Arnold himself has been meeting secretly with British Bomber Command for over a year. Now he must determine which aircraft and how many can best be used in a global war fought in widely different theaters. Arnold set his first plans in motion. He orders his old friend Jimmy Doolittle to strike back at Tokyo using medium bombers launched from aircraft carriers. He immediately moves heavy B-17s and B-24 Liberators to England and Australia, along with C-46 cargo planes to India and medium bombers and fighters into North Africa. Until now, German fighters have controlled daytime skies over Europe, forcing the British to bomb targets only at night. Arnold convinces Allied planners that precision bombing requires visibility and commits American air power to lead the way. In February, he sends General Ira Aker to direct the U.S. 8th Bomber Command. And on September 17, 1942, U.S. 8th Air Force B-17s, rising from bases in England and led by Aker himself, make the first daylight raid against the European mainland, hitting marshalling targets in Rouen, France. Arnold has not invested all his hopes in the B-17s and 24s, however. Four days after the Rouen raid, the prototype for a new bomber rolled out of a Boeing hangar in Seattle. It has three pressurized cabins for high-altitude, long-distance flight, and is designed for a single mission to provide Air Corps planners with a weapon with which they can bomb Japan. It is designated the B-29 Super Fortress. But if 1942 is the first year of American participation, 1943 is the year they bring the battle to the Axis powers. Arnold is determined to strike at enemy soil. And January 1943 provides him with his first chance. Aker's 8th Air Force launches bombers against the naval bases at Wilhelmshaven and submarine bases at Emden. Germany is struck for the first time in broad daylight. At home, Arnold's pre-war effort with heavy industry is paying off as well. By May 1943, American factories are turning out warplanes at the rate of one every seven minutes. Monthly output matches that for 1939. American aircraft are being flown by every Allied nation in the war. In the summer of 1943, Arnold met with General Leslie Groves, head of the Manhattan Project. The problem, as Groves explained it, was that his group was designing a new kind of bomb, larger than any built before, and he needed help with ballistics testing. Groves estimated they needed an aircraft with extreme range, capable of handling a bomb 17 feet long and weighing five tons. Arnold creates the 509th Very Heavy Bomb Group within the 20th Air Force. Made up entirely of B-29s, they recut the bomb bays of the 509th for the atomic weapons Arnold knew Leslie's people were creating. By August, American bombers are making their deepest strikes into Europe and Germany. 
RAF and US 8th Air Force bombers working in tandem firebomb Hamburg. Hundreds more are sortied for raids against ball bearing plants at Schweinfurt and Regensburg in an attempt to cut off aircraft production. These massive missions are called maximum effort. By January 1944, Italy has given up, and Germany's famed Africa Corps has been driven from North Africa after the Luftwaffe is swept from the sky. Arnold decides to place his African commander, Jimmy Doolittle, at the head of the 8th Air Force and taps the dapper Karl Spots to head all strategic air forces in Europe. Eisenhower agrees. He has a date in mind for D-Day, and the first priority is air supremacy. Without it, his 150,000 ground troops will be trapped on the beaches. Arnold gave his orders directly to them. My personal message to you, this is a must, is to destroy the enemy air force wherever you find them. In the air, on the ground, and in the factories. In order to accomplish this goal, fighter tactics changed. Instead of simply escorting and defending the bombers on missions, the fighters now attack the Luftwaffe. March, air raids to Berlin are taking place by as many as 1,400 bombers and fighters with drop tanks. With factories and cities under daily bombardment and new aggressive assaults on their existing aircraft, German air supremacy collapses by May. It will take another year before Germany surrenders, although the die is cast. Japan's command of the territory, Southeast Asia, the Philippines, the Chinese coast, have made any attempt at hitting Japan itself all but impossible. The distances were simply too great. Now, Japan's home islands, untouched since Doolittle's raid in early 1942, feel the brunt of Major General Curtis LeMay's 21st Bomber Command B-29s when they hit Japanese steelworks in Yawada. Japan is no longer safe. On December 15th, Congress creates a new rank of General of the Army, and Roosevelt awards fifth stars to four officers, including Hap Arnold. As 1945 dawns, it is clear in Washington that Germany is teetering. And in March, Arnold directs the largest strike force ever assembled to smash Nazi Germany's capital, Berlin. 1,250 bombers and 645 fighters. 3,000 tons of bombs and rockets. The city is virtually flattened. Six weeks later, it is over. During the spring and early summer of 1945, B-29s of the 21st Bomber Command firebomb most of Japan's major cities, including Tokyo. The devastation is immense. Even the Imperial Palace is burned. Arnold cannot believe that they still will not submit. Japanese ground casualties are running five times as high as American losses. Japan responds by launching kamikaze suicide planes against U.S. ships and vows to never surrender unconditionally. Arnold is with Chief of Staff George Marshall and President Truman at the Yalta summit when word is received that the atomic test has been successful. After a series of meetings, Truman gives the go-ahead. They go over a list of targets, eliminating Kyoto and Tokyo, the old and new capitals, and decide on the southern headquarters of Japan's home army, Hiroshima. 
Montenian Island, Tibbets, and the 509th have been practicing secretly for two months. Even the other crews do not realize that the Enola Gay has not dropped a real bomb since arriving. Now, August 6th, their time has come. Tibbets and his crew of 11 take off from Tinian at 2.45 a.m., carrying the 9,000-pound little boy. It is only now that they are airborne that true significance of their mission came clear. Nearly five and a half hours later, flying at 31,000 feet, they drop little boy and dive away. Three days later, a second B-29, headed for Kokura, but finding the target obstructed, diverts to their secondary, the shipbuilding port of Nagasaki. This is a larger bomb, and it kills nearly 20% of the city's quarter million population upon explosion. August 15, 1945, Japan offers unconditional surrender. The war is over. Arnold has seen his nation and guided his service through the largest war in human history. Because of his efforts, the nation's air forces were trained and prepared. He proved the strategic importance of air power. But there was one final task for Hap Arnold. For our protection, we must have an Air Force second to none. For this, we need a great aviation industry, a great air transport system, and a great body of trained personnel. On September 18, 1947, President Truman signs the National Security Act, creating a new Department of Defense, and with it, a new and independent service, the United States Air Force. General of the Army, Henry Hap Arnold, proved out his vision. From the fledgling pair of Wright planes that began the Aero Squadron, to an Air Force of more than two and a half million people and 75,000 aircraft. Above all, he believed that success came from anticipation and research. His combination of elements as commander, thinker, planner, and innovator made him a great leader and a legend of air power.